Well, that's the question we've been asking over the last few weeks. What happens when grace happens? And how can you make certain it happens to you? As we continue this conversation about grace, you might find an outline of the morning's message helpful. It's in your weekend handout along with a couple of blanks for you to fill in at the appropriate time and some key verses. I'd like to invite you to pray aloud now the prayer that we pray each week as we enter into the message of grace. Dear God of all grace, please grant us the grace to receive your grace and grant us the grace to live it. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1853, a plan to rescue thousands of New York street children was announced by a new charity, the Children's Aid Society. It would send the children to live with families in rural America. By 1929, the society had relocated over 100,000 orphaned, abandoned, or neglected children. As far as I know, my father hit the bottle pretty heavy and they took us away from him. And my mother died when I was two years old. My mother and I were very close because I was all she had and she was all I had. On January 7th of 1918, my mother came to the school and she had a suitcase. She was going to go and have tests, take care of, see why she was having these awful headaches. That was the last I saw of her. My mother uh, bore five children and she accepted responsibility for none. She just simply brought the we children, us children, into the world and then let the rest of the world take care of us. We were hungry. I don't ever recall taking a bath in a tub of water. We slept on old dirty mattresses on the floor and the rats ran over our heads and through our hair lots of nights and we'd wake up screaming with it. We don't know where our parents were. We never did know. The trains that carried the children out of the city became known as orphan trains. Among the many stories of the children of the orphan's train is the story of an eight-year-old boy by the name of Lee. He was one of three sons, and his biological father decided that uh, he was unable to care for his three boys. And so he took them to the orphan rescue center where they would be loaded onto the orphan train. The oldest boy, Lee, eight years of age, stood on the platform, and the father told him goodbye, but as he told him goodbye, he placed a pink envelope in Lee's shirt pocket, saying that upon this envelope he had written his name and address, and he instructed Lee, once Lee reached his destination, whatever that would be, for him to contact his biological father. Well, Lee, again, was only eight years of age. He was the oldest of the three boys, so he made sure that they sat together on the train. The train took off for Texas from New York City. Lee and his two brothers fell asleep, and they slept all night as the train traveled. And when Lee awoke the next morning, he reached into his pocket, and, and the pink envelope was missing. The envelope that contained the name and address of his father was gone. He never found it. He never knew what happened to that pink envelope. What I'd love to tell you is that the father of Lee found Lee and found the two sons. What I'd love to describe to you is a moment in which the father searched out his boys and found them and reclaimed them and took them home. But I can't tell you that story because... In the case of Lee, the story never happened. But in your case, it did. In your case, it did. Right at the heart of the story of the Bible is the pursuit of God. His determination to find you, 
to claim you and to name you and to bring you into his family as his own. It's not enough for him to call you forgiven. God wants to call you his family. Listen to this great promise out of Romans chapter 8. All who are led by the Spirit are children of God. So you should not be like cowering, fearful slaves. No. You should behave instead like God's very own children. Adopted into his family. Calling him Father, dear Father. And since we are his children, we will share his treasures. For everything God gives to his Son, Christ, is ours too. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. You see, God didn't just acquit us. He adopted us. He didn't just declare us forgiven. He declared us a part of his family. Although the forgiveness is no small matter, is it? In fact, when you try to understand grace, you realize that there must be acquittal before there is adoption. That God must deal with our sin before he can call us his son. He must take us into a courtroom before he can take us to the dinner table. And it is in the courtroom that God acquits us. I went to a courtroom once. I was a college senior in a town called Abilene, Texas. I had gone downtown to run an errand. And when I came out from running the errand, I saw a parking ticket on my windshield. I was surprised to see the parking ticket because I never saw the no parking sign. But as I looked again, I saw that the curb had been painted red, which meant no parking. But actually, the curb had been painted red a long time ago. And thanks to the West Texas sun, that red was becoming kind of a bleached pink. And I thought to myself, I have a case. I can take this to court. I can, I can plead my case. And so I went to the municipal court. And sure enough, they gave me an opportunity to stand in front of the judge and plead my case. He reminded me of a judge. I mean, he was, he, of course, he was a judge. He just had this caricature, though, about him. Remember, he had a dark beard, a very deep voice. Of course, he wore a black robe. He held a gavel. It was all very official. I'm glad there wasn't a prosecuting attorney because I didn't have a strong case. But what I had, I used. I explained to the judge, Your Honor, it used to be red, but now the curb is orange. It's very easy to mistake. I, I, I didn't mean to park in a no parking zone. He was not very impressed. He asked me, did you park in the no parking zone? I said, yes, sir, but I went to line of reasoning number two. I said, I'm just a college student. I'm on a budget. I can afford the $5 fine, but I can't really, you know, take, it's just going to be tough on me. Besides, I'm a good kid. I explained to him I'd never been to court before. I explained to him that of my two brothers, I was the better brother. <laughs> I explained to him that I, I was making good grades. I was going to be a productive, constructive member of society. He asked me yet again the same question. Did you park in the no parking zone? I said, yes, sir. You know what he did? He slammed the gavel. He declared me guilty. Guilty. Right there. He said, I was guilty. You know what? That was his job. That was his job. I may have preferred a different verdict, but his job as judge is to enforce the law, isn't it? His job as a judge is to promote justice, not to distribute leniency. His job is to interpret the law and apply it as clearly as possible. When I stood in the courtroom, I stood in the mercy of the court, and I had violated the law. You and I have violated God's law. We have broken the law. The law at minimum of our conscience. The law in addition of society. 
and the law ultimately of God. We stand in his courtroom. You do and I do. We stand before a judge, not the judge of a municipality, but the judge of the universe. And one of the characteristics of God is that he is a just God. He is a just God. He cannot misinterpret the law. He understands the law. He is the creator of the law. Our judge, the almighty God, not only enforces justice, but the scripture tells us that he hates sin. One prophet said this about God. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. It's absolutely impossible for God to look upon a wrongdoer and have no response. A just judge must punish that wrong. Those who have stood before God and had the curtain pulled back did not even try to defend themselves. We think of the example of Isaiah, the prophet, who stood in front of God. And and when he saw God, he said, Woe is me, I cried. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He didn't try to defend himself. He knew that the judge was a just judge. And the scripture says that God will judge each person according to what he has done. You see, God hates evil. And he judges fairly. You and I have committed evil. Would you agree? Sometimes we have parked in the wrong place because we thought the red was orange. But you know what? There are many times we saw the red as red and we parked there anyway. We just deliberately disobeyed the teachings of God. So where does that leave us? Standing in the court, evildoers, wrongdoers, before a just God whose very character is to punish that which is evil. Where does that leave us? Here's Here's what God tells us to do. God on the bench looks to you and to me on the courtroom floor, and he says, turn your gaze away from me, the judge, and look at my son. And we turn and we look, and there standing with us in the courtroom is who the Bible calls our advocate, the one who comes to stand with us. And God the judge invites us to ask our advocate, Jesus Christ, is it true what they say? Is it true that you never violated your father's commands? Is it true what they say, that you perfectly fulfilled every detail and expectation of the law. Is it true what they say? That every step of your life you sought to please and successfully pleased your father. Is it true what they say? That you never, never sinned. Not in thought, not in deed, not in speech. That you never sinned. And then is it true what they say? Is it true that you have voluntarily decided to serve not just as my advocate, but as my substitute? That you're going to do more than just take on my case, but you're willing to take my place and to stand here and receive the guilty verdict that I deserve so I can stand there and receive the declaration of innocence that only you deserve. Is it true what they say? Now, when I stood in that West Texas courtroom, there was no son of a judge who stepped out to serve either as my advocate or as my substitute. Consequently, I had to pay the fine, though I will say he lowered it from $5 to $3. So at least my persuasion did something, right? But I want to tell you something, folks. Someday, the person you're looking at is going to stand before a holy judge, the judge of the universe. I'm going to stand in his courtroom. And I have absolutely no fear of that moment. None whatsoever. I do not dread that day. I do not dread that day. It does not keep me awake. 
It offers to me no anxiety. Quite the opposite. It gives to me a moment of hope because he has told me what to do in that day. On that day when he declares me guilty, I will say to him, you are right. But I will turn to his son, my advocate, my substitute. And I will say, is it true what they say? That you, Jesus Christ, led a perfect life. But that you died a sinner's death. For people like me. And I will declare that I long ago placed myself under the protective custody of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And I will be reminded and remind you that those who do so will not be declared guilty. Because he has already taken on our guilt. And the just judge who must punish sin, or he would not be just, has adequately and satisfactorily and forensically punished sin in the life and in the form of Jesus Christ. Consequently, those who abide in the new kingdom will do so not as Illegal stowaways who snuck in when no one was looking. Quite the opposite. We will have been declared innocent because of the grace of God and the sufficient sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The Bible says it like this. If you belong to Christ Jesus, you won't be punished. Period. But don't leave the courtroom yet. It would, it would be beyond our fondest imagination for the judge to declare we the guilty, not guilty, right? But our judge wants to do even more than that. Having acquitted us, God chooses now to adopt us, to adopt us. It's one thing to leave the courtroom with the penalty paid. Listen, it's quite something else entirely for the judge to stand up from behind the bench, remove his robe, set down his gavel, walk down the steps onto the marble floor, and walk up to you and say, I acquit you, now I adopt you. Guess what? You're going home tonight with me. I'm giving you my name. You're going to sit at my table. You're going to live at my house. I'm going to adopt you because you are my child. He marches us from traffic court, if you will, down the hallway into family court where he performs the second transaction and he adopts us. This was God's plan from the beginning. Long ago, Even before he made the world, God loved us, and he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through whom? Through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. You see, in the great grace of God, we discover that he begins by giving us a gift, the gift of salvation. He continues this gift through the act of redemption by publicly purchasing us, just like Boaz purchased Ruth made provision to take her home. So our Lord Jesus is our kinsman redeemer who takes us home. Consequently, because we have been gifted salvation, because we have been purchased, there is no question but that we are now accepted. We are accepted by God. We are accepted because he has first of all acquitted us, but then even more, he has what? He has adopted us because we're acquitted, because we're adopted. We know we are accepted by our heavenly father. What a beautiful paragraph this verse is, isn't it? It's like a treasure chest, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4 is. The scripture says that God loved us. 
Why would he do all this? Because he loved us. Somebody here today needs to be told God loves you. God loves you. You're just living with this assumption that God is ticked off at you. He's not, my friend. He's not. When he sees you, his eyes widen. He smiles. His heart raises. He cares deeply about you. You're never too tough, too old, too sophisticated to know that God loves you. God loves you. And not only does God love you, God chose you. He chose us, Paul says. He chose us. Sometimes we can look at other versions of the verse to get a better understanding of what a verse means. So I went through different versions looking to see how other Bibles translated this phrase, he chose us. Look what I found. The New Century Version. He chose us. Contemporary English Version. God had Christ choose us. The New International Version, he chose us. The New King James Version, he chose us. The King James Version, he hath chosen us. I guess there's only one way to say it. God chose us. Maybe you know what it's like to go unchosen in life. If you were to look in my high school annual from my freshman year in high school, you would see in the sports section that our freshman basketball team has two photographs, one photograph of the A team and one photograph of the B team. Now, we had on our freshman basketball team 22 players. So 10 of the players made the A team. How many does that leave on the B team? 12 of us, 12 of us, of us. The problem, however, is that in our little high school, uh, we only owned 20 uniforms. There were 22 players, but only 20 uniforms. So on the day of the team photo, the 10 A-team guys got the A-team uniforms, and they're in the first picture. Then in the second picture, there are 12 guys, 10 wearing the 10 remaining B-team uniforms, and two wearing blue jeans and tennis shoes. Guess who's wearing blue jeans and tennis shoes? I know it's hard for you to believe that, me being the athletic specimen who stands before you today. But I not only was not chosen for the A team or the B team, I got unchosen for the B team photo. I finally got over it after several decades of therapy and and counseling. But all of us have gone through something in life in which we were unchosen, right? We were picked over. We, we didn't get selected. But I got to tell you, folks, it's one thing to go unchosen for the B team of a basketball team in a small town. But it's something else entirely to spend your life living under the assumption that you are unchosen for life. Now work with me on this. We live in a world that has bought into a vain, futile philosophy that says that none of us were chosen. None of us. That we emerged out of some flotsam in the universe that landed like microbes in the sea. And one of our great, 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 great grandfathers decided it was time to step up out of the water and start walking up onto the beach and turn into a monkey and then turn into a person and then turn into a human being. And then someday you die and it all disappears and we go back into the dust again. And there's no real decision to be here, no reason to be here, no source no destination, no beginning, no end. We just are. No wonder we're messed up. We're not chosen. We're just accidents. We're just happenstance. We're just evolving. We pop up and we disappear. Folks, if you think you came from a monkey, you're going to act like a monkey. <laughs> right? <laughs> you, you will. Because there's futility in that thought. There's no purpose to that thought. If you think you came from nothing, you're going to think you're worth nothing. And so you're going to behave like nothing. And you're going to end up 
as nothing. But contrast that with the truth. Contrast that with the truth. Contrast that with the fact that you were thought of long before the earth was created. That you were seen by God. You were named by God. You were claimed by God. You were placed on this earth at a specific generation in a certain time because he has a particular plan for your life and mine that includes our blessings and includes our burdens to shape us into the kind of people he wants us to be to prepare us to inherit the kingdom, the new kingdom that is yet to come in which this life now is preparing us to inherit that new kingdom in which we will dwell and serve not just as citizens or servants of God, but yes, as children of God, because he has such a dream, such a vision for all of eternity, and he has invited you to be a part of it. You have been chosen. You're not an accident. Everything in your life tells you you are, but you've got to take a firm stand against that futile, dark way of thinking. Let grace change you. Because you have been, look at this, adopted by God. You've been adopted by God. I have heard of surprise pregnancies. I have never heard of a surprise adoption. maybe there is one I don't know but there's something about being adopted I may be talking to somebody today who was adopted by parents look at you you were selected by them they chose you those of us who have biological parents were not chosen by our parents they were stuck with us (laughs) when Jack Lakato was handed this little baby called Max Lakato. Jack Lakato could not hand Max Lakato back. (laughs) Though he may have seriously considered it. He couldn't. The hospital gave him no option. He couldn't say, oh, that's not the kind of nose I wanted. Or that's not the length of a boy I wanted. Or I wanted a girl. I don't want him. He couldn't. He was stuck with me. But if you were adopted... That means that some parent somewhere looked at you and said, yeah, she's the one. He's the one. We're taking this one home. They could have passed on you, right? They could have said, well, we're holding off for another gender, maybe different skin color, maybe different ancestry, different age. They could have, but you You were the one for them. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, yeah, but if they had known what I would do the rest of my life, (laughs) they may not have adopted me. That's my point exactly. God did know what you were going to do the rest of your life. Your heavenly Father knew everything you were going to do before you did it. And he said, I still want that child in my kingdom. He has adopted you. He has claimed you, he has bought you, and he has brought you home. Folks, that will change your life. That simple truth will change everything about the way you look at yourself and the way you look at this brief time on earth. You let that teaching of grace sink deep within you. Let it go so deep within you that it begins to define how you act and define the way you treat other people because it will change you. A similar truth changed that eight-year-old boy's life that I began the message with. I didn't finish the story of Lee, did I? It started off in great difficulty. Placed on the orphan train, he and his two brothers. He fell asleep that night, and when he woke up, the pink envelope was gone. He didn't know where to find his father. Things got worse. They traveled all the way to Texas where his younger brother was adopted in one city and they were loaded back on the train and he was separated from his younger brother. A few cities later, his other brother was adopted and he was separated from him. And Lee was all by himself. In a central Texas town, a farming family took him in and he was so homesick and afraid he thought about running away. 
He woke up early the next morning and he didn't know how to act on a farm. And he went out and he opened up all the cages where the chicks were. And all the little chicks got out. And the farmer said, I can't have a city boy on my farm. And he took him back. And the orphan train had not left. And he put Lee back on the train. So Lee spent another couple of days going from city to city. Until finally another family took a chance on him. A family that he describes as a man who was tall and slender and a, and a woman who was plump. And they took him to their house. I want to tell you what happened next. He went to bed that night making plans to escape. But he fell asleep. He was so tired. And when he woke up the next morning, he found himself at the breakfast table. Here are his words. I slid into my seat and I reached for a steaming biscuit. But Mrs. Nailing, that's the mom, stopped me. Not until we said grace, she said. I watched as they bowed their heads. Mrs. Nailing began to speak softly to our father, thanking him for the food and the beautiful day. I knew enough about God to know that the woman's Our Father was the same one who was in the Our Father who art in heaven prayer that visiting preachers had recited over us at the orphanage. But I couldn't understand why she was talking to him as though he were sitting here with us and waiting for his share of the biscuits. I began to squirm in my chair. Then Mrs. Nailing thanked God for the privilege of raising a son. I stared at her as she began to smile. She was talking about me. And she was calling me her privilege. And Mr. Nailing must have agreed with her because he was beginning to smile too. For the first time since I'd boarded that train, I began to relax. A strange, warm feeling began to fill my aloneness, and I looked at the empty chair next to me. Maybe in some mysterious way, our father was seated there, and he was listening to the next softly spoken words. Help us make the right choices as we guide him, and help him make the right choices too. As I heaped my plate, I thought about that. Hate and anger were running and running away had seemed to be my only choices, but maybe there were others. This Mr. Nailing didn't seem so bad, and this thing about having an Our Father to talk to shook me up a little. I ate in silence. After breakfast, as they walked me to the barber shop for a haircut, we stopped at each of the six houses on the way. And each time the Nailings introduced me as our new son. As we left the last house, I knew that at first light the next day, I would not be running away. There was a hominess here that I'd never known before. At least I could choose to give it a try. And then there was something else. Although I didn't know where Papa was or how I could write to him, I had the strong feeling that I had found not one but two new fathers and that I could talk to them both. And that's the way it turned out. It can turn out the same for you. Having been acquitted by God, your judge steps from behind the bench and he places his hand on your shoulder and he says, I now adopt you. And he walks you from the court of accusation down the hall to the court of adoption. And he formally adopts you as his own. Would you receive his invitation to be his child? Oh, dear God of grace, please grant us the grace to receive your grace. And then grant us the grace to live it. In Jesus' name, amen.